Hello, lovely humans. I'm Wildly, and you are listening to Sex Stories, a podcast to help us explore ourselves and our own delightfully depraved, dirty minds while listening to what perversions and pleasures our fellow sex explorers play with, so we may all lead lives that get us laid in the ways that we actually want. Thank you for keeping your sexy thoughts about me and our guests to yourself. Remember to go listen to the outro if you want to learn how I like to connect and enjoy. Our guest today is a 37-year-old pansexual, hetero-romantic, white cis man who is in a monogamous relationship with his partner of 17 years. Kinky and adaptable in almost all circumstances, he enjoys BDSM, exhibitionism, and voyeurism, foot fetishism, male chastity and denial, pregnancy and lactation play, and so much more. A computing engineer originally from Florida, he now lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, Alec Bond. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Alec, if you had to rate yourself on a sexual shame from one being shameless to 10 being super full of shame, where do you fall right now? I'm going with a two. There's still maybe one or two topics that are those fleeting thoughts that cross my mind once a year or something that I'm still not ready to even shame talk through with myself, much less the world, because things will disappear over time. Like I'll think that I have an interest and it just disappears or floats away. I don't think about it again, kind of a fleeting thought. And then others sit there and grow into a nice little tree that uh, finally sees the sunshine and I may bring up or uh, experiment with. The ones that grow into trees, do the trees unshame? And the fleeting ones, do they stay shamey or is there a correlation or does it just depend? No, normally if it's a completely fleeting and it just disappears, I don't think about it again. So I don't know if I okay. could associate shame with them. It's just like there's a shame in the moment of having the thought mm -hmm. and then maybe it will never recur. Anything else that sees sunlight, normally shame pretty much disappears rapidly. I wonder, this is a question for our listeners, if anyone else out there has the internal response of like, oh my God, I want to know what your shamiest things are. I keep trying to think about like what mine are and the parts that I still keep inside. Like, are there any that you remember now that you're like, oh yeah, that's still shamey? And have you told those to anyone close to you? Oh, absolutely not. I, I would rarely admit to myself that it's something that's passed my mind. It's okay. uh, kind of just strange, dark passenger thoughts, I guess. Wow. Okay. Okay. So are there any other places in your life where shame comes up, like with people or zones? Yeah, I don't find shame with my thoughts, preferences, whatever, but I find places of where it's appropriate or not. And I say that because I've heard other guests go, oh, well, I don't want to talk about it with my parents or I don't want to talk about it at work. And I don't have a shame about it to my coworkers. I just also wouldn't talk to them about a lot of my other hobbies just because it's not the appropriate venue for it. So I'd say my shame's pretty flat across the board, regardless of who it is. It's just a matter of whether or not they care to hear about it or it's appropriate at the time. In your personal sphere, where are the appropriate talk about sexy places? Anytime somebody so much as bats an eye about something that could possibly be an interesting topic. So I said, oh, don't talk about it at work things. But I've had things pop up where somebody said, oh, I used to live in that city too. And I used to go to burlesque shows there. And uh, myself and my wife both do pole dancing. And so I've told them, even in an interview for a tech position I work in, I went, oh, did you ever attend any of these venues? And they said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, if you went there in between this year and this year, and there was a man there, it was probably me. And that's still not like getting into my deep, dark desires. But a lot of people would go, wait, you talked about that with a, a potential coworker? And I go, well, yeah, if they don't like that and choose not to hire me because of it, would I want to be on that team? Or if they do really like that, who cares? To me, it's just still fits into the team fit, personality fit, whatever type of thing. Yeah. Um, Love that nuance. Okay. Can you give us a little overview now of what your sex life is like and what are your favorite parts right now? Right now, it is secretive. It is secretive because uh, myself and my wife, we have three children, and they are three and a, a most, almost four. One that just turned eight and a, an almost 11-year-old. And we live in a rather rural area outside of Atlanta. We've been homeschooled just because of our schools. Pre-COVID, I've worked from home for many years pre-COVID and everything. Mm. So they are always here. And that makes anything with sound at any time of day, anywhere in the house, become a secret mission almost. It's, hey, what would be a really good idea? What can we have you do that's safe where we're not completely in our heads going, are they laughing in the distance? Or did somebody 
fall out of a tree and hurt themselves, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so right now there's a lot of, oh, hey, everybody's eating breakfast. Mom and dad have to sneak away because we need to put away laundry while our hands are free. And those types of little covert things aren't necessarily ideal, but it's become entertaining to its own accord. Yeah. What's the dynamic like between you and your partner? It sounds like there's something juicy there. We're fun. I am definitely the immediate gratification or complete lack of gratification one of us, whereas she's more of a a slow buildup and sizzle through. So sometimes a sneak away is, hey, I'm in this mood. What mood are you in? And it doesn't always match. There's a a lot of that where, again, the uh, book that I've read after listening to this podcast, Come As You Are, going through that, she and I had many a talk about, oh, yeah, I'm just like, I've got two accelerator pedals. It's not a, a, a gas and brake. I've got two of them. Me too. And realizing that she has a few more breaks in that. And having that realization about each other is where we got into a lot of things in the introduction you mentioned, like chastity play and denial stuff, because it's a way for us to, I feel like compromise always sounds like somebody's not getting what they want. Totally. It sounds so disappointing. It's not compromise. It's agreement, I think. For example, if I'm very in a mood and she's perhaps not in the same mood, that becomes a perfect opportunity or time to introduce denial aspects because maybe it's she does not want to, hey, let's go spend 30 minutes and put on lingerie and get showered up and have a whole whatever session of anything at that time. But if my mindset is focused on I am right now horny. I am right now really desiring things, whatever else. It's a fun shift that she'll go, oh, well, that's really great. So I'll consider that later if X, Y, Z, whatever type simple task things like you do good at work today. You help me with dinner tonight, whatever else. And my thoughts that were already on sex can stay there, yeah, but can kind of focus them through other things. And because I like denial and I like anticipation, maybe later the day has gone well, we're both in great moods because we did everything together, we cooked a great dinner, we had a great evening, whatever else, maybe it'll shift and it will turn into what I wanted earlier in that day. But maybe who knows what, her break is still there or anything else where she's not at the same level of desire. It's really easy to go, hey, no, you're going to have to earn it and wait another day. And boom, just like that. Totally. That's where I feel like it's not necessarily a compromise. I'm still getting something I really enjoy out of it. And her investment into that is minimal, but she also through time has found that it's still kind of fun to be snarky with it. She likes to see me happy, just like I like to see her happy. And so even in a bad day for one of us or the other, if we can see that we can readily have an effect on the other one to make them happy, feel desired, feel complete, anything else, then yeah, we're going to take that opportunity. I love that. And I would like to offer the phrase creative strategizing or just collaboration. Like it sounds very collaborative and it's like you are mutually, like you said, agreement, but it's an agreement in a specific direction and it's active. It's active collaboration toward your pleasure in a way that actually fits into your life. And it sounds like can stretch and change, which is fucking awesome. Yeah. And that came out of being young and having times where one or the other of us would have a different mood, a different day. Our works were different, whatever else, a different perspective on a day than the other. And we would have times where it's like, oh, my mood is this and yours is something different. And we would catch ourselves being frustrated with each other because of it. And I see so many people where they get stuck with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I want this and they don't like that or they don't want this. And it's like, they don't want that right then. How do you get to, you know, using it at its correct time? Totally. I love that. Can you tell us now what is sexy to you? I'll say opportunity with an advised willingness. Because being willing always isn't necessarily the smartest thing to do. Taking advantage of opportunities is not always the correct thing to do. So I I throw an advised willingness that goes into everything. So willingness to be uncomfortable, willingness to explore, willingness to be embarrassed on either party. I love that specificity. When do you feel sexiest yourself? To me, it is 
when I am desired. Most often I feel desired through means of objectification. I really like the reverse chauvinism almost of that. So we both work at pole dancing studios. We both did a lot of pole fitness stuff and whatever else. And I really liked the kind of reverse dichotomy of when we would go and perform at a show or something, and there would be nine, 10 women doing things that were way beyond what I'm capable of. But I really appreciated getting to go in and be the token male that an audience of friends of these pole dance communities were mostly women who were also there for fitness or were also dancers or whatever else. And getting to play the part of the lone male out, there's a very comfortable to the audience and to myself objectification of a man in that situation. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the same desire that perhaps my wife has for me? No, it's, it's not the same level, or at least I won't know if it is, but it's feeling desired. It's feeling complimented. It's feeling like I'm wanted. Yeah. What counts as sex for you? I want to quote the Supreme Court. I don't know what it is, but I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> the official ruling on pornography, whenever that was. Yeah. Did you ever get an explicit health and safety talk or lesson in consent growing up? Consent, absolutely. I grew up kind of as the youngest of four children. And then when I was a teenager, my parents adopted more children. We had a lot of consent talks just because I think by the time I was the youngest, my older siblings were up there in grade levels in school and everything else. And so I think my parents saw on the horizon, oh, hey, we've got these daughters who are attractive and we have boys showing up and whatever. So let's teach them how to be safe, how to be, you know, expressing their consent towards anything. And I just kind of overheard it. So there wasn't the, we're going to sit you down across the table and talk to you and give you a hard time about this. It was just one of those things you just accept, like learning a language by immersion. I learned consent just by immersion because the schools talked about it. People talked about it. Families talked about it. And so it, it wasn't ever an explicit discussion, but it was known and communicated uh, thoughtfully mm. as opposed to just, oh, they've got cable. They probably know about it. Right, right, right. And then, so you didn't get a sit down talk. What about like sex ed at school? Florida is, is not very well known for their schooling. It was the most stereotypical Americana third grade, fifth grade, and then seventh grade, I think. Third grade is a hey, you might notice that your body's changing. And here's a video that's of the Mr. Rogers or, or Bob Ross era and kind of that presentation level of like, here's a friendly person who's going to give you very calm but very forthright information about how your body will change throughout puberty. Fifth grade, I think, was a repeat of the same thing, but they also gave you a free deodorant to take home and yes. said, please don't show up to class smelly. Seventh and eighth grade was a lot more scientific and it was less with the intention of having anyone be safe or hygienic or anything else. It was really like, here's your body. Let's learn about all the organs and your sexual organs just happen to be part of that. So we've got chapters on that too. Interesting. Okay. So now as an adult, do you have an example of a very clear yes that led to something sexy? Oh, I feel like I have a lot of yeses that are in the that lead to something sexy, but it's like you're already uh, two turns down the road and it just lets it go further. Myself and my wife, we will have perhaps partaken something that's casual to us, a normal make out and a normal, hey, we're making out and this is going to turn into PIV sex in a position that we're already familiar with. And if we're really shifting gears and going to something completely wild that one of us thought of or something that we haven't previously discussed, we will normally not introduce it at that time, but there are like soft bends in it, like changing to a position that is perhaps one that you do not know or don't do often, or is just an opportunistic one because, Hey, you're on a couch this time and there's an arm of a couch there and that's not on the bed. Favorite. Those types of things. When we were younger, we would try to just like, I'm going to take your hips and put you in this position. And then you realize that, no, that's accidentally get kicked in the face or something as you're trying to move somebody's body around and they go, how do you actually want me? So all the time, those soft shifts will have a, Hey, there's an arm on this couch. Can I do this and put you over that? And then you don't accidentally get kicked. Nobody falls and makes something into a, a humorous or injurious time. So those subtle absolute yeses happen all the time. They're very fluid with having a relationship and, and going on. 
Other ones usually directly come from conversations. Again, I spoke about chastity and denial stuff. That came from me kind of twiddling in my mind and going, well, I don't want to make her feel pressured to pleasure me if I'm in that type of mood, but I also don't want to find myself being upset and anything else. And I sat there during a very boring work meeting once and just went through it on the little notes app and made bullet points of like, hey, here's how this might work. And we're watching some dumb food show or something at night. And I went, hey, so I've been thinking about something. What do you think about this? And she goes, yeah, 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 that's fine. We can do that. And I'm like, but I prepared a whole presentation on why it makes sense. Can I go through that? And she's like, yeah, you can go through your presentation. And as I went through it, she goes, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I hadn't thought about it at that angle. That makes sense. And so that was a very good, very distinctive, I would like to do this. Can I do this? Can I do this? And will you be involved with it? And is there an angle of this that could be also interesting, arousing, whatever for you? Yeah. So it's a very distinct yes that definitely turned into good things. Wow. Okay. So you are monogamous. So maybe you don't have recent experiences with safer sex conversations, but take us through your experiences and what you remember of them for yourself. So early on, just coming from small town and whatever else and not being well educated, I had paranoia about everything. Anxiety, perhaps not paranoia, not just sexual things. Early on when I was 15, 16 and first getting involved in dating or anything else, there wasn't questioning anything. Like there wasn't a hard talk with anyone of, Hey, should we use protection? Hey, are you comfortable with protection? It wasn't a negotiable. And in my minimal dating experience before my wife, it wasn't negotiable for myself or whomever I was dating. The people that I was dating were very much like me. And so there never was a selling the idea of contraceptives or condom use to someone else. The first partner or two that I had, there was not much correct discussion of things other than, hey, we've both never had any partners before. That means we're safe, right? I don't remember. How did that class say? We can try to look this up on the internet. Gosh, we're really both horny. Let's go for it anyways. So not always the best advised decisions, but yeah. that was it early on. And then when my wife and I did our couple of years that we worked in the adult industry, we worked almost solely with each other. We worked solely with each other for anything that we considered sex. Mm. But there was still things, rope bondage, flogging scenes, stuff like that, that still involved other parties. So through the consent talk with other people, there would also be a talk regarding not just physical safety, but all aspects of safety. And to the point of monogamy, myself and my wife are monogamous. We don't have any other love interests, any other partners. But one of our best friends that we've known for years is in poly relationships, and she enjoys being a bottom for particular types of impact play. I don't consider impact play sex. My wife does not consider impact play sex. Our best friend here does not consider impact play sex. So I still consider myself monogamous. She is not in a sexual relationship with me. She has a loving relationship with us, but it is not the same degree of loving relationship that myself and my wife have. It's not a romantic love. We absolutely love her. She loves us. It's yeah. just not a romantic love. So there as well, we've had discussions regarding safety because with impact play, occasionally there may be small amounts of blood left on a toy or a piece of rope or whatever else. And so with her having other partners from her poly relationships, we'll have continuous discussions about that before whenever we play, just to make sure that there isn't a need of heightened concern on our part. Absolutely. Even monogamous relationships have to have health and safety conversations ongoing, especially if you're kinky, you know, like switching holes, like trying new things. Yeah. A note on partner is my spouse's name can be gendered to either gender. And so I have found it entertaining as I've worked through particular different regions and states where people are more or less open to the idea of someone being in a homosexual relationship that I would say, oh, yes, me and my partner with their very openly gendered name, and our kids are going to go do this. And it kind of helped me gauge where I need to be with discussions with people in the place as whether they know, did he just say partner? And is that a girl or a boy name? As opposed to people who go, oh, 
well, I'd love to meet him. And I go, oh, I'm sorry. It's not that. It's kind of a mean playfulness, but I, I like to play with that and uh, see where it brings me. I don't know. I'm really learning about humans and meanness. And that to me just sounds like a playful litmus test, unless you're using it to like trick and trap and shame people. Then I, then that's mean, but that's a little yeah, bit different. No, it doesn't sound like It's weird. not ill-intentioned ever. It's more of a playful thing. Okay. Now let's go through your sexual timeline. I'd love to hear what formative milestones shaped your sexual being. Take us back to your early years and start with, what do you remember first? I go way back to when I was probably three-ish and I still lived in the Northeast. And probably the earliest remembrance I have of gender existing even, like I just, as a child, you tell, are told, hey, here's a mother, here's a father, and you accept it. So it wasn't until I think myself and my siblings, we got lost in the woods once, you know, it was the early 80s. You could just go and play in the woods. That was great. And going, I really have to pee. And I could. And so I did. No problem. And then we're still lost in the woods hours later. Uh, This whole time, we're maybe half a mile from our house, if that even. We were not lost. We just couldn't see the front of the house anymore. Uh, And one of my sisters mentioned the same thing. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll wait. No, I'm going to wait until we get home. Okay. And that was just like one of those little tiny sparks of like, "Hmm, I wonder why. I wouldn't want to wait if I have to go to the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I then kind of just jump and stagger through for some years until knowing, I don't know, maybe kindergartenish time, knowing that there was stereotypes. And this was, again, all the 80s media, the 90s media, um, between music videos, even outside of music videos, just the ads that showed up in the newspaper at the time, recognizing like, oh, men desire women. And there's some reason why I don't know yet, but there is. And, oh, there's jokes in the whatever family circus comic in the newspaper about the little boys disappearing with the uh, JC Penney's uh, bra ads. And I don't know why they do that, but these types of things have a running trend. And so you start to go, why is there a trend around this? I I don't get it. I then go to a couple years older than that. So I'm probably first grade-ish or so and having uh, morning erections. And I remember just like waking up and I'd wake up super early. No idea why. Way earlier than I needed to wake up for school and be sleeping on my chest and just be like, oh, look, okay, well, that feels nice that's present. Okay. And, you know, would sit there and just go, well, that's an interesting thing. There wasn't any playing with it or anything else. It was just like a, oh, you exist. Hello. Welcome to the world. And okay, you're going to go away by the time I go to eat breakfast at the table. And so I don't have to say anything about it. No one had told me to be not talking about it. I just didn't think to the same way I didn't think to talk about picking my nose or any of my other bodily functions. Yeah. You know, you would tell an adult if you need to go to the restroom so that you have the proper facility. But other than that, unless something hurt on my body, no reason to bring it up. That's just the way it is. Then jump through there up until I got involved with computers. I was from a family of computer engineers, uh, the same field I'm in now, and got an upgrade to the home computer. And my older siblings already had computers. So this was probably like 94, 95, very dawn of the modern consumer internet era. How old were you? I was uh, 10 or 11. Okay. And because my father worked from home at that time, we had internet connectivity in my home. So I had a computer and I could do anything with it if I could learn how to use it because I didn't have an operating system on it or anything else. So that early on, my my older brother, who's uh, seven years older than me, he went, oh, Here's an operating system. Install it from disk. If you can figure it out, you can use the computer. And that got me into just the text internet. I didn't have graphical browsers, Internet Explorer, Netscape, anything yet. I just had all text stuff. So I was going around the internet to old bulletin board systems and chat programs to see all the chat rooms or or channels that were around. You would just say, list them. Well, if you are on the right set of servers and you say list, you would see, oh, golf talk, okay, baseball, sports. And then there would be 
things that you couldn't quite read because it's P zero R N T one T T one three S. And you go, what is exclamation point porn titties? I don't know. Well, if I don't know something, I need to probably learn about it. Just like school. If I don't know what a word means when I'm reading a book, I go to the glossary. The glossary is right here. Let's dive in. So my first like real knowledge of sexual things beyond just like an anatomical was a pretty deep dive into the world of internet and fantasy and whatever else. I was properly, again, anxious, paranoid. I didn't want anybody to know I was there. I didn't want to break the computer or anything else. So I, I was just always a lurker. And mm. that was for the best. I didn't have to lie about my age. I didn't have to worry about people asking me weird questions because I didn't need to talk to anybody. There was so much just to read and consume that way. And so for better or worse, that's where a lot of my early but still useful uh, sexual knowledge came from. I think it gets a bad reputation when you think of it as pornography, or at least nowadays it does. And yeah, there was absolutely stuff that was purely just explicit for the sake thereof and great. But there was also a a lot of stuff shared in those same things that was what nowadays you'd find on the shelf in Barnes and Nobles yeah. because it was deemed explicit just because it had advice on how to provide pleasure to someone as opposed to just anatomical differences. So not all of it was intended to be erotic, but kind of circles back to, I said with my wife and I, but if you can do something that is providing pleasure to someone else. Why wouldn't you? So it wasn't necessarily intended to be erotic or intended to titillate, but it absolutely was that because it's like, oh, well, here's how this zone works and here's how the nervous system works. And if you tie these two together, you find how really good things work. Pretty quickly thereafter, it was, hey, this reading this stuff, looking at this stuff is nice feeling. Um, nice feeling mentally satisfying, perhaps, as opposed to nice feeling physically. I remember I was in junior high and I remember not understanding when people would say random insults to people. In an elementary school, people would go, oh, it's a dork. And then sometime you go and you look in a dictionary and you go, dork means whale penis. That yeah. makes that much funnier to call somebody that. I like that now. <laughs> and I was in middle school and high school in the very late nineties. And it was this like, really big insult to call somebody a jerk off. And it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, I don't like that kid. He's a jerk off. And I remember hearing him being like, the movie, The Jerk, is that what this is about? Or I don't get it. And because of reading these things, uh, some of them were very tutorial-like. So there were things on how to give an excellent blowjob, how to just masturbate, whether you're male or female or whatever else. And so you read enough of that. And I find it's like any other fascinating hobby. If you get interested in pens and you start looking around, you, you read all about how they roll across paper and quickly you find yourself with a pen out rolling it across paper. And if you read enough about how to make your penis and your body feel really nice, well, God damn it. If I have a penis, it's going to come out and I'm going to see if these people are right or not. <laughs> so yeah, I was probably early teens, like hmm, maybe not even teens, 12, 13 ish in there. And way back to first discovering waking uh, hard-ons or whatever else, morning erections, you know, you eventually find, oh, well, it feels nice to just hump my hip against the mattress or whatever else. So then reading these tutorials just kind of combined it. And honestly, now I can't remember if it was weeks, months, days, or years of doing that without actually fully orgasming and ejaculating or not. I do remember reading about, oh, you know, people do this and then they have an orgasm, but I didn't know what it was. So I wouldn't yeah. have known it if I saw it. And so I think that I was masturbating to completion before my body was actually capable of ejaculating. But I don't know if it was that I really wasn't, you know, making it all the way past point Z or if my body was just not ready to make it past point Z. So, hey, here's you made it all the way. Congratulations. But, you know, there's no reward shooting out of the end. Yeah. So that was in those times. And I remember going back to school and just chewing on it, on it mentally. And the next time I heard somebody call somebody a jack off or something, I was like, but do you know what that is? Because like, I don't know if that's bad. Like, have you jacked off? This feels really good. And other kids, I th think it was in the cafeteria or something being like, yeah, actually jacking off is really cool, dude. I don't know why people say that either. 
<laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So like, just like that, we singularly defeated a uh, jack off or jerk off as being an insult in my middle school by having like two or three other kids be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I am so grateful for all of the people out there that are like, but wait, literally, isn't it like this for you? And then everyone else around is like, yeah, yeah, I have, I have that experience so often. Um, <laughs> I just couldn't imagine someone going to an adult and being like, oh, well, here's a big insult for you. You're somebody who has sex and finishes at the end of it. And it's like, <laughs> well, they, uh, yep, you got me. <laughs> so when did we get to touching other people or letting other people touch you? I had, uh, again, anxiety. The poor girl that was uh, essentially my my first girlfriend, I very unfortunately probably drove her up a wall because she was really stepping out of her comfort zone to make it very clear the things that she desired from me. And at this point in time, I'm talking like, have your arm around me at the movie theaters, you know, peck me on the cheek in public. She was stepping so far outside of her comfort zone to push for things. And I think she thought that I was too stupid to know what she was looking for, as opposed to, no, I'm just too scared shitless to take action upon it. That's everywhere in life. The I don't want to start drawing something because then if I fail, well, then I fail. But if I don't start it, I didn't fail. And that fear of rejection, even from somebody who is doing everything up to the point of explicitly saying, no, really do this to me, wasn't there. And so we were riding on a bus um, from an event in our town one day and a boy in front of us, you know, turned around in the seat of the bus or was like sitting with his back to the window as, as people did at that time on the yellow school buses. And she was sitting next to me. And we were just being flirtatious. We were 14. And this kid, he might have just been small. I remember thinking like, oh, he's like eight or nine. You know, this was a local concert thing they bust kids into. And he's like, you guys flirt too much. Why don't you just start making out? And I was like, what the, that, how did this kid read us so well? And uh, so this girl, she just grabs my, she goes, are you ever going to kiss me? And I went, I kind of just hesitated for a moment. Huh? And she just grabbed me. and starts kissing me. And I don't remember what the hell I physically did yeah. because mentally I just lost it. And I don't mean lost it in like, an, oh, this is amazing. This is erotic. This is everything I've ever dreamed about. I'm in, in the like, what the hell is happening? And when am I going to wake up? I don't know what's happening. Did I ruin this? Is this good? Is this bad? I laugh about it. Now. I still remember she pulls back and she goes, oh, well, that wasn't what I expected at all. And then just turns and looks out the window. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my first experience, like beyond like, hey, let's hold hands as we walk across uh, campus. We had a big open school. Wow. It's really funny now. At the time, it was just uh, re really anxiety inducing and confusing. We essentially dated. Uh, I'll air quotes that. We still like met up and hung out and went to the beach together and did movies together. But that was the end of physical contact for us. Like, I think she had built up that this was going to be, you know, like the pinnacle moment. And, and I knew at that point that she had dated other people. And she definitely was, I don't mean it to sound in a shaming way, but she was definitely more experienced than myself. And yeah, no, I think that just killed it for her. I think it was like somebody who maybe thinks they want to live in another country or really likes a food. And then they go to that country. And the first thing that happens is a car passes them and throws mud on them. And they just go, this is shit. <laughs> and that was that. And then uh, shortly through that year of schooling, I, I ended up switching schools. So my shame was able to uh, rest in peace over there. Wow. Do you have any advice for, I don't know, forward ladies who are like, hi, hi, no, yes, no, the signal, like, I guess sometimes you just got to let other people do whatever they're going to do. And if they don't pick up the signal, you just let them go. Or like, is there any sort of like, I mean, you're so young in that story too. That's, that's just a first experience, but. <laughs> that's the thing is I think she thought I was missing the signals. And yeah. so I think she was like, oh, you know, the telegram didn't work. Let's put yeah. up a beacon. Like, oh, the beacon didn't work. Let's put, and she was in continuously increasing signal strength. I read it all. I heard it all. <laughs> I just hadn't kissed anybody and again was so afraid of screwing it up that I was just a, a deer in headlights with it. Now what would be the dream in that situation would be to go back and and me to have the lack of shame enough to go, mm. hey, I really like you too, but I don't want to screw this up and I've never kissed anybody, so I'm probably not good at it. What do you think? And she might go, oh, it, or might go, well, I'll teach you. You know, who knows how it could have gone. <laughs> who knows? Wow. Okay, so 
high school, mid high school, you switch schools. We only have a few years until you get to meeting your partner, if I'm doing math correctly. Yeah. So I played in a uh, punk band throughout high school. I played bass guitar and was uh, occasionally an on and off front man for it just because for some reason, singers were less likely to show up to continuous practices than guitar players, bassists, and drummers. I don't know. <sighs> and we had filthy songs and we had filthy songs about all the lovely things that we would like to do to people's genitalia and <gasps> stuff like that. Like our lead guitar player kid, he was hilarious. And um, I don't know who to compare it to. I'm sure now just like the lyrics of them, people would think is Eminem ish or something like that, but it was punk. So it was a completely different presentation, but he had whole songs he had written that were just like choruses of like, no, seriously, girl, I just want to lick you from where you pee and stuff like that. That was overt. And I'm absolutely sure when he wrote it, he meant it and he meant it to the bone, but I ended up as the front man occasionally. And so I'd end up singing this stuff. And so there was this weird reputation that we got. I acquired more of a bad boy vibe than I perhaps deserved. <laughs> Skateboarder, played in the punk band, you know, surfer, whatever, all this type of like stereotypical 90s, whatever stuff. So then when you front me on that stuff, I had a reputation somehow of being fantastic at cunnilingus before I had ever seen a vagina. <laughs> and... I wasn't one to go out of my way to dispel this myth because again, what makes me feel sexy, I like feeling desired. And this had fantastic results where people had this held opinion. It wasn't like directly discussed with me. It's not like I had people coming up to me and going, Hey, so I heard you're really good at this. It was just this kind of Mobius around me. And that resulted in uh, the, the first date with one of the girls that I dated in high school. Well, I guess, no, it was direct. Somebody bringing it up as she went, Hey, is it true that you can do this? And I went, yeah, of course I can. You I, did. You know, That's very I'm play bold. The false confidence of oh, I've read enough. There's only so many ways I can screw it up. Right. I like twisted my tongue upside down in the conversation I was like, yeah, you just turn upside down and you twist your tongue vertically and whatever else. And great. She too was young. She too did not have much experience in this. So she too had no idea whether I was serving her a fine champagne or uh, something from a, a gas station wine bottle. So she thought it was fantastic. And that's great for me. And that was great. And because she had her little pod of friends and her extracurricular teams and stuff. And so I, yay, this reputation somehow worked out. And I don't know if it was the faking confidence or whatever else, but kissing and everything else just kind of came in a uh, swoon with that. You know, I figured okay. that out as, as well with things. Uh, while I was dating her in high school, I took French class. Central Florida, lots of kids who already knew Spanish took Spanish. And I went, I don't want to compete with them. They speak Spanish at home. And German was already full when I signed up. So I took French. I took French and was the only male in the class. Kind of like I said earlier, with doing pole dance as a man, I liked being out of the way. I got to hang out with the girls who I'm much more comfortable around and whatever else. So that's where I met my wife. Now, at the time, she was dating someone else, and so was I. And we met, and we were just pals. I mean, like, hung out in class, talked about music, made fun of the teacher, whatever, just to high school bullshit. We didn't hang out outside of school or anything else. We just knew each other. Throughout the high school years, I ended up breaking up with other girlfriend and having another and breaking up and just normal high school pettiness. And at the time, ICQ and AOL were big internet talkways, whatever. Oh, yeah. My now wife and I would talk on AOL just about crap, you know. Hey, is there another band at the concert venue this month? Whatever. We didn't go to concerts together or anything else. We just chatted. And we both went away to college. I ended up dating another girl for three and a half years, pretty much from high school through early college. And when we went to college, we went to different colleges and that just rapidly fizzles. And I was heartbroken after it and thought like, oh my gosh, um, my parents were married young. They were both 18 when they wed. And so I had kind of come up in this like, oh, that's how it works. My sister was wed when she was 18. I think my grandparents were 18 and 19. It was just... There was no one saying this is the way. It was just the path I saw. Yeah. So I was heartbroken after this girl. And I got into my collegiate slutty days. Kind of found myself in a little bit of confidence. At that time, I had gone from always being way too skinny. Like I think my biceps were as big as my wrists through high school. It was not a healthy looking thin for my frame and everything else. 
But now at college, I was working for the university as well. I was going out surfing. Like I worked four days and did school four days, and then I went surfing three. So that combined with being late teens and whatever hormonal changes suddenly started to go, oh, I don't have to wear long sleeves and long pants all the time to hide my, you know, wiry spindleness or whatever else. And at that time, I lived 30, 45 minutes from my hometown. Living there one night, and one day I have the chat programs open on my computer, and I get a message from my now wife just going, hey, do you remember me? It's like, yeah, we only like hung out and talked for like years. What do you mean, do I remember you? And uh, she was at a different university and had just broken up with her boyfriend, said, hey, do you want to, you know, grab coffee or something sometime? And I went, yeah, sure. And she says to me, okay, great. So we met up for coffee, nothing to it. And from there, we went and said, well, let's do something else. We'll do a, a dinner and a movie thing. And she says to me, well, is this like a date? Like we're just friends or is this like a date date? So this is, again, the um, where a woman is being rather forward. And I'm going, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And so I probably let her sit there, you know, what felt like forever, probably five minutes or something. And I went, let's go for date style. So I talked to her friend, still lives in our hometown. I was going bowling with her and some friends that week. And I said, hey, friend, I have like an actual date date with now spouse. You know, what do you think of that? She was a mutual friend of both of us. And she goes, if you go on a date with her, I'll fucking kill you. She's not ready to date again. She just got out of relationship, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, she said that with a, she didn't say it as angrily. She said it in the angry tone, but like, yeah, yeah. not as a, I'm going to hurt you, but as a protect my friend. Like I'm being serious with you, but also being friends with you. Yeah. And so, yeah, we went on our date, everything went off good. And we both went, Hey, I'm not looking for like bullshit. Like I don't want to, Hey, I'm heartbroken, long relationship. And that sucked. Like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Do you want to have kids? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? And we both just grilled the snot out of each other while we walked the beach for hours and hours until like three in the morning or something. And then it started downpouring on us. And we ran back. We couldn't find which parking lot my truck was parked at. And we laughed about it. So we took a picture together on like the first cell phone with a camera or whatever back then yeah. of the two of us in my truck. And I regret it now. I cropped it. And I cropped it because she was wearing a very nice white tank top. And we just got caught in the pouring rain. And it was completely see-through at that point. And I have no bloody idea why the hell I did that. <laughs> but we still laugh about that because we still have that picture. And on our anniversaries, whatever, we'll be, hey, here's our, you know, all these years together. And so I brought her home and, you know, gave her a hug, whatever. Went to kiss her goodnight. She goes, no, 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 no. You can't kiss me yet. I'm like, oh, no. So, so here's this circle of, like, weird denial shit. And I'm like, okay. Like, what did I do? When did I fuck up? I didn't realize I fucked up. And she's like. I don't want you to think I'm easy. So you have to wait at least three dates and then prance, you know, skips prances inside her house. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. From there, it was uh, just a, a steamroll. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. What do you think on that waiting on the kissing thing? I mean, I do notice that I don't wait to kiss and I'm single. So I'll just put that out there. <laughs> I'll say she, she'll say that she regrets it now. But it was still worked out. It was really just like uh, some of our first dates, like her ex was still calling her being like, hey, you should move back to the city again. Uh -oh. Again, we're very honest with each other. She was like, hey, this thing we have is really new. And this thing he and I have is like, we have years of stuff. And yeah, it got rocky, but I don't know where I feel yet. And it was that a little like hurtful to me. Yeah, because I'm like, oh, great. Now I'm in competition with this guy and he's already proven he's a shit bag. Like, come on. But at the same time, that honesty w was really appreciated because it was like, okay, cool. Like, I know don't invest too deep emotionally, mentally, whatever yet until you figure this out. But hey, I'm still in the running. So let's keep trying to figure this out in my favor. Yeah. I want to circle back to the part where you were going down on ladies. What happened to your anxious self? Was it the rock star thing? Like, was it rock star syndrome that suddenly made you be like, I could just do this? Or was it because you had nerd knowledge? Like, what was it for you? It was somehow nerd knowledge combined with dick driving, not even ego driven, just pure, holy shit, this feels really good to me mentally. I am very satisfied. Other people are very satisfied. This is great. I'm giving someone pleasure and it's pleasurable to me in ways that I do not yet know. Great. Okay. So in those details, I hear that you were getting the feedback both in your own body and it sounds like from partners that it was actually good and you were able to kind of like calibrate. There was definitely feedback. 
back that, yeah, to a 17 year old kid uh, yeah, seemed yeah. very positive, but yeah, I, I don't know beyond that. I just knew that I enjoyed it and other people reportedly did too. So I was That's great. keeping at it. Okay. I just because I'm a person that like I guess it's a self trust thing or it's a care. Th- I don't know. I, that's where my anxiety comes up. Where I'm like, was it good? Like what? Nah, what? I don't know. Like that's to me is so like bold and brave. Unless I'm really getting told to do something outside my comfort zone to just like initiate and do it. So I struggle with that now with things with my wife all the time. We learned very early entering into BDSM type stuff. My hearing and the phrase "ow" and the phrase "ooh." are very similar and so we've had plenty of like ooh ooh oohs or oh oh oh's that i've had to say wait 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 sorry i know i'm killing the mood is that an o or is that a no okay so let's get into your kinky stuff like what do you in tell us the details you told us some really hot stuff in your intro where do you want to start and also like pole dancing how did that happen also 17 years is a long time take us away (laughs) My wife in her leaving this ex, again, she wanted to find the confidence and get rid of her own vulnerabilities. So she went and paid a private studio to do nude photos of her. And so she did that. And that was before we had gotten together. That was one of their previous breakups. But she shared them online because she was really fucking proud of these and rightfully so. So when we got together, she was still endeavoring to make something out of that. And this is, again, I'm talking IRC and this and that. This was way before modern commercialization of pornography like it was absolutely commercialized but it just wasn't the same beast that it is today and at the time playboy was still doing in-person tryouts and things so she went and went with me and she had one or two of her friends with her and she went and she auditioned with playboy and got to meet some of their key named photographers and whatever else and at the auditions that she was at she was the only brunette and she was the only one with natural breasts She also happens to have very, very striking, bright green eyes, which also just really helps her stand out. And so one of the key photographers for Playboy pulled her aside too and said, hey, I also, whether, you know, they want you for this or not, I also want to shoot you. So she did end up being chosen from that audition casting. She did get to appear in a couple different editions of Playboy, never the mainline play. Oh, no, she wasn't one of the mainline Playboys as just a single photo, never a spread or anything. And then she got to do some of their lingerie special editions. Through that photographer, we started meeting other local photographers because they'd say, hey, we're going to do a big photo bash. We're going to get these 10 girls and we're going to go down to the beach and get them all naked and take a bunch of pictures and trade around. Yeah. And one of those people said, hey, you guys are pretty cool because people would always get iffy about me being there. They'd go, oh, great. Young guy. He's going to come and be jealous or get in her way or be a pain in the ass. You know, they all learned that from experience. And we would go, yeah, well, if she doesn't know you, she's not going to be naked without somebody she does know. So do you want to do this or do you not want to? So I very quickly got the in with the pros where they were like, hey, yeah. No, he's cool. And one of them said, hey, you guys should go to this adult convention that I go to. There's lots of other photographers and stuff there. And so we went to an adult fetish-based convention. It's in Tampa, Florida. It's still running today. It's huge uh, fetish con. And so we went knowing nothing. And we went for like a half day and hung out with these photographers. And we were just hanging out and chatting and, you know, watching other people do shoots and stuff. And inevitably, one of the guys who owns a rather large rope producing company said, hey, have you ever been tied up? And she goes, not yet. And they go, do you want to be? And she goes, sure. So pro guy just really quickly whipped together a pretty quick little shibari thing, had her there in the hotel room. And they're like, how does that feel? Whatever else. And she's like, yeah, it's fine. It's whatever. And they're like, okay, well, do you care if we do photos of this? And she's like, I'm already here. Sure. Go for it. So that just like slowly escalated. And it wasn't like a, oh, we're trying to just push you one step further. It was yeah. absolutely a Hey, is things cool? Like, do you want to, like, you're here, you're only here at the convention for a day. Do you want to, you know, get more out of it? And so she ended up doing nude Shibari type photos there. And then at the end, they dropped her a large amount of cash for it, not buying the rights to or anything else. They were using it just for their own collections or whatever else at the time. But she wasn't expecting to be paid. She was just there for the experience. Yeah. I was just there for the experience. We were just hanging out with good friends and talking art and tying people up and whatever. So the next year when that convention rolled around, we had set up 
our own stuff and whatever else. And we knew that there was money in this and we knew these people were cool as heck. And I really liked it. It, it had a huge overlap with the Tampa Renaissance Fest, which is the Bay Area, which is so wonderfully named Barf. And the amount of people that attend the Renaissance Fest and like their leather and whips and rope mm-hmm. and old guard and the biker community and then the fetish community, it was like, hey, I know you. Oh, you're like all these little things just tied together. We know everybody. And so by then we were working in other content and other content. So many of the women that attend that will work with photographers and whatever else, but so many of the photographer companies will show up and have a crew and they'll just be filming women doing solo work. Well, she had a guy. And so they would go, Hey, if we do all the pretty bondage on her, are you okay to, you know, go in there and spank her or whatever else? Cause you guys have a good dynamic and whatever else. I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. So that escalated to us writing entire scenes of like, Oh, okay, <laughs> here's how we're going to do whatever. And then me running it. And it just kind of worked. The, the exhibitionist in me liked it. I was a guy that could perform on camera that alone got us a lot of things, but then also like, Hey, when I'm pulling her hair and we're making out and stuff, it looks pretty real. It looks actually passionate. Oh no, it really is. And (laughs) so that footage and stuff sold better. So content creators there, I already had things for feet and whatever else. Like we already had like, oh, these are, we lovingly call them the slut shoes. You know, you cannot walk in these. Well, she can walk in them, but you're not intended to walk in these, you know, six inch heels and stuff like that. And So when content creators, especially in the fetish world, are like, oh, hey, and you have small, pretty toes and feet, like, hey, is it okay if he, like, sucks on your toes while you do this and that? And I'm like, fuck, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, let's do that. And so a lot of our growth there was driven by our own willingness, again, to do things, but it also was ways to explore things we were already interested in, but it kind of got us over the hump. So if there's something that you are maybe interested in, but you're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth setting up a crazy amount of dildos to do an insertion scene at home. Like, do I want to take the entire drawer out just to do that? No. But if you're being paid for it, then, oh yeah, you can make a whole thing out of going from this one to the next one to the next and whatever. And so that got us into a lot of stuff. We then made friends at our local dungeons because, hey, the same people and these travelers, as well as we made friends internationally from that. One of the first conventions we went to, a, a gentleman that was still in our lives now, we we're crossing on a crosswalk, not even at the convention center, just near to it. And she was wearing like a kind of pinup dress and heels, but not, you know, anything adulterous of heels. And I had like a suit on or something. And he went, hey, this guy's wearing like a Hawaiian shirt. He's from up north and being in Florida was scorching him. And he goes, hey, do you guys want to do pictures for a book? And we went, well, we normally only do paid shoots and stuff now. And he went, oh, that's a bummer. I'm trying to put this book together on the cheap, but you guys have a really cool look. And if you end up with spare time, you should come to me and we'll we'll see how this will work out. And then we met him again. We bumped into him in the halls or something. I said, okay, sure. Show us what you got. He goes by Lord Morpheus and he runs or ran for many, many years. He has multiple books written about bondage and rope and everything else. And then he also ran for years the Morpheus bondage extravaganza, which took place worldwide, but it did have a location in central Florida that we participated at. And from that, you know, she already had her little, hey, I got to be in Playboy and published. And we were on these DVDs with these amateur companies and whatever else. But then we also got to be in a book. So we're also published in there. And his book was all about different things people do. So he had sections on pegging, sections on rope play, foot worship, food play, all of this. And so we were kind of going, well, he has these people who are really, like really, really into latex and rubber play. They have all the equipment. Obviously that's who he's gonna shoot for that section. So when it got into sections on pegging and stuff like that, we went, hey, yeah, that's us. Cause early on, just in the discussions of like, hey, what's really weird, but what do you think you might like? It actually started out as like a, hey, you know, she's giving me a blowjob. And throughout that, she's, you know, playing with balls and whatever else. And then she's getting reactions from me. And I, back in that wonderful world of erotica and masturbatory youth, had read tons about prostate play and anal play for men. Likewise, despite considering myself completely hetero romantic, 
I had read group porn and uh, homosexual porn, whatever else through that. So I was like, Hey, yeah, there, there's absolutely something to discover here. And so because we were comfortable completely switching in these things, it worked for him because he could come in and get the content of, Oh, well, here's a guy who's being a top in this scene, or here's a guy who's being pegged here and whatever else. And so we were thinking, we were going, what can we do for this guy? He's really great. He comes and hangs out with us and everything else. We really want to wow him with something. And I went, you know, I bet he doesn't have anybody in his book that can suck their own cock. And she went, yeah, I bet you're right. And so I had been a teen and being tall, thin, and lanky, I don't remember the day I found out, but I can reach. And I can reach enough to put my nose to my testicles, like can reach. And people will go, oh, you must be really gifted. And it's like, I'm very flexible. <laughs> I am not a exorbitantly large penis or anything else. I'm probably straight in the most statistical means of length that there could be for a white male in America. But I can reach and I don't mind reaching. So we filmed and did videography for him. And instead of it just being, oh, well, here's just some random guy sucking his own cock, because sure, that might be somebody's thing. That might be great to somebody. But instead, we turned it into her like rolling me up to do this. And so instead of it just being me doing that, she's doing it with me. So there's all these male fantasies of two people or whatever else, you know, uh, having their lips on the opposite side of a cock at the same time and whatever else we can do that. And we didn't need a third person. So that became our fantastic conversation piece. There's a lovely photo of myself and my wife with a penis in our mouth and everybody looks at it and twists their head and they go, there's only two of you in that picture, aren't there? That was always a fun one. And so that became the party trick to pull out for content creation an early fetish website that's still around that's a, a large site categorizes everything. And we, I was very proud that we got to write to their webmasters and go, do you have a section on auto fellatio yet? And they went, what the hell is that? Yeah. And so we got that in. And so that was one of those, this is something that we do. And other people go, whoa, wait, wow, what? There used to be a Central Florida publication called What's Happening Orlando mm-hmm. that was primarily a gay and lesbian advertisement and small magazine that existed in the city. And they used to do an annual nude issue. And through people we met up and they said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you guys are okay being in the gay magazine, but you're a straight couple. And we're like, it's just naked people. Right. And they're like, yeah, it's like, we're all going to wear costumes and be naked in a field and do naked modeling stuff. And it's like, great, great, great. It got out as well that I was capable of this. And that turned into a whole (laughs) nother fun time um, just because of a different audience. That's so fun. You are definitely the first person that I have talked to who has made out with their partner on their own cock. How wonderful. I feel like you probably have a thousand stories for us. And I'm really curious about all the details, but I want to highlight some of like the stuff that we haven't talked about yet that you mentioned. First, I want to start with pole dancing. Like, I know that that's not explicitly sexual, so it's technically kind of odd, but it is erotic for so many people. And I would just like love to hear because you mentioned it, like, did it work into your sex lives at all? And did you think of it as sex work or was it all sounds very exploratory? Also, hashtag life goals. So we never did it for pay. Well, I take that back. We taught classes for pay. Got it. Okay. But the classes that we taught were much more based on gymnastics style pole dancing than it was erotic style at first. So we had moved across the country at one point and my wife started doing pole fitness just to feel ourselves kind of an empowerment thing. And I also was not so healthy at the time. And so I was running and counting calories and all this kind of stuff. And in my mind, I went, she goes off and dances with her friends for an hour a night, three nights a week. And she's now freaking ripped. And I'm running, I'm eating food I don't like, I'm counting calories, and I still look like shit, and I feel like shit too. And so I said to her, I said, so would it be crazy if I came to your classes? And they went, no, why? So I went and started taking classes as a student at first. And it was a bit of a struggle because it is not purely a male versus female anatomy, but it is a large portion of it, um, centers of gravities and things. So Mm -hmm. some of the more gymnastic type movements that are perhaps lower on the learning scale for women are higher on the learning scale for men. Likewise, certain things that many women will struggle to do because of hip-based weight centers, um, a man may be easier at initially. Simple things like inverting into Aisha's and things like that. Very often men will find that they 
have a pre-existing upper body strength and that their hip weight momentum, they're able to do it. Whereas that's something that for women entering into these things, it's normally considered a level two, three plus Mm -hmm. move for them. So I struggled a little bit because the instructors didn't know what to do with me because of this. And we found that there was a huge movement overseas, particularly in Europe and Eastern Europe, with very stunt-based male pole dancers. A lot of them exist in the United States as well. There's some ridiculously amazing people here too. But like when we were first going through Instagram and online, this is like 2015 time period when we got into pole dancing. A lot of what we saw was overseas. So instead of going to my instructors and saying, hell, what do I do? We could go in and say, hey, here's something a guy's doing. Is that something I can do? Particularly things that I was very weak at, a lot of doing pole dancing is thigh holds. I always joked to people, my thighs don't even see the sun, much less see the friction and pressure of holding 200 pounds off the ground. Whereas women often have better thigh grip. Their thighs are more used to being exposed, shorter shorts, whatever else. So I got into that and did just like the studio's local little, hey, come do a show off thing, whatever else. And they had classes that also were heels classes. So these were much more eroticism based. They were kind of the crossover with the chair tease classes and stuff. So chair tease for us did circle into the bedroom, but almost humorously, like learning particular moves and going, okay, hey, I'm going to do a chair dance for you, whatever. Whereas our home pole is installed in its own room and we have very nice lighting in there and stuff like that, but it's not you know, nice bedroom thing or whatever else. It's, it's a, this is a fitness area. Yeah. So the heels classes, I started going to, and they said, you know, you don't have to wear heels, whatever. So I'd go to them in socks so I could slide around and do tricks. And then I went, okay, I'm going to learn this. I've seen enough of the guys do this. I can do this. I had a very large struggle finding pole dancing heels in my shoe size that I think were actually considered for pole dancing. I think most of them were considered for drag queens to do performances with. Yeah. So there wasn't a entry level two inch, three inch, four inch heel. There was eight inch heels. Yeah. (laughs) So I got my introduction to pole dancing and heels in eight inch boots. And so much of its platform that I was amazed by how good I was at walking in them naturally. So another studio opened in, in the state we were in and we helped fund a little bit of their starting and we were doing everything from painting to installing floors and whatever else for them. And it was purely a sport based pole dancing place, but people kept going, but don't you guys do erotic classes sometime, right? Sometime, like maybe after your clothes. And so we started an after dark class and I, cool. uh, I am not a certified pole instructor. My wife has gone through different certifications and she is qualified, certified, whatever. So she would run the classes. I would come in for choreography or doing the examples and whatever else. And so we ended up doing the after dark shows uh, or classes, excuse me, to bring in anybody, whether they had ever done a poll or whether they were rather advanced. And we do over the course of like three courses, here's an entire five, eight minute long song choreography, but we're also teaching you the tricks in the middle of it and whatever else. We ended up having male students as well. So we also had fun with adjusting various things. It wasn't super gendered, but there are times where it's like, hey, during this pause or break, if you're a male or a female or whoever wants to do whatever, you may choose to do this part and you know thrust, grind, whatever in this manner versus if you're somebody who can do this aerial move, you might do that because it would accentuate your butt very nicely. But from there, we just ended up doing local bar performances, burlesque shows, just stuff like that. My wife is definitely way more acrobatic and powerful with it than I am, but I got to be the token male. I wanted to ask you, did you guys know how compatible you were sexy wise? Am I projecting here? It sounds like you're so compatible and you did so many sexy things together and here you are still like sneaking around a bunch of kids. I think the compatibility came from the openness part. Occasionally I'll sit down and have conversations with her and go, hey, do you have any really wild ideas that you think about that I haven't done yet? And very often we just go, no, Mm -hmm. because if we did, we would have already brought it up. It's kind of like trying to buy gifts for each other at the holidays. We go, do you need anything (laughs) for your birthday? And we go, no, if we needed something or wanted it, we bought it when we could because we did. So I don't know if when we were both 19, we had all of these things already sprouted inside of us and they just happened to align. I think it's more so that we had 
kind of firm roots about what we wanted out of life or a relationship. And hey, if you plant two trees in the same field, they're both going to grow towards the same sun. And so you both kind of branch out in that same direction. And I think that helped us a lot. Wow. Well, not everyone has the same experience. I can say that for sure. I would love to hear if your foot fetishism, well, first of all, how do you experience it? And it, did it come from that first day when they were like, do you want to suck her toes? <laughs> Ooh, I could get into all types of Freudian analyzations. Of that one. <laughs> um, I think some of that's just Florida and Florida is a, a very sandal and painted toes and beachy state. It's another part of the body that's out. But you like them or do you like yours to be worshipped or both? Oh, no, I have no interest in, in having mine ever not in shoes, ever touched, ever <laughs> Really? Yeah, I just couldn't care less about it. It's not like an aversion to it. It's just not an interest of mine. It started as purely a just a visual thing. If I saw a person who has a nice face, I like a nice face if, mm. for whatever value of nice that is. It's the same thing for legs, butts, any part of the human body. At first, it was just part of the whole picture with doing film and stuff and with experimenting with each other at all. Yeah. You get little early card games that are like, would you ever do this or whatever? And it's just such a big category. Yeah. It's like, I think other than perhaps rope bondage or blindfolds, it's like probably even passes those as far as like stereotypical male fantasy things. Really? Oh, yeah. I absolutely. literally, so few people talk about it with me. And I have a huge fantasy about going to dinner with someone who has a foot fetish and footsing them under the table. And I have yet to meet someone who, like, will admit if they have that fetish. Like, I just. That's wild to me. Maybe it's because all my uh, search histories and everything else are tuned to me because of the <laughs> modern internet. But even when we were filming stuff, it seemed like a very popular category. There's categories of people who really love sweaty feet, dirty shoes, this and that. And there's a whole category for like pedal pumping. Like let's get the truck stuck. And we're doing this. My wife's done some of the pedal pumping videos, but that's not erotic to me. Uh, that's not my cup of tea with it. My cup of tea with it outside of just the visual look of it is very specifically physical and sexually based. Mm. So I like the texture. Hands feel different on the body. Even just rubbing on the back, hands feel different than a foot does, yeah. particularly with regards to the penis, the face, being freshly shaved on the face and having hands or feet or breasts, any part of the body. It's also a good way with my switchiness to get into a, uh, I don't feel like it's a topping from the bottom, but some people will say it is where it's a, Hey, I'm in the interest of doing something where I can provide you pleasure. And I find it sexual, whether or not you find it sexual. and having someone allow you to give them a foot rub yeah. most people aren't like oh no no not that anything but that it, it's pretty it's a pretty easy way in we do a lot of massage we do hot stone massage wax massage whatever for the whole body but feet are a focus of that and shoes and stuff i just that's uh part foot fantasy that's also gets into legs and stuff just the Again, doing pole dance and being in higher heels, the change that it makes to your hamstrings and glutes and everything else is very visually appealing to me. And then with feet too, there's some of the subservience in it, not in the service method. I still haven't found quite the way around it, whether it's humiliation, degradation, or if it's just a objectification or something of like, hey, I'm in a really feeling submissive mood or want to get out of my head, whatever. You're watching a show. Can I just lay there in front of you and have you put your feet on me or yeah. rub them over my face or whatever? And I would be completely content to just have her sit there and not give me any interest at all. There's a kind of a bored and ignored fetish there of like, I'm not giving you the attention you want, but I'm not like completely stuffing you in a corner and giving yep. you zero attention. I'm yep. being like, yeah, you can use that if you want to, uh, like feigned reluctance. So I like to have them on my penis, whether they're dry or whether we're lotioned. I like to feel them on my body pretty much anywhere. Normally they end up on my face, my chest, whatever, particularly during penetrative sex. It's like, hey, I'm already putting your calves across my chest. What if I just bend your knee a little bit and then I can do this as well? Sometimes it's very involved foot jobs from her perspective where she's like really killing her thighs because of whatever position we're laying in and she's lifting her entire leg over and over or whatever else. Other times it's, Hey, can you lay on the side of the bed and just present your souls to me? And I'm going to stand there and just fuck them because <sighs> it feels cool. nice and you can relax and whatever else. A personal favorite that we got into, it started as a joke. We both kind of were like, ha ha, um, food play. People 
always talk about sex with food play and they always want to talk about whipped cream and they want to put it close to their genitals and stuff. And it's such a bad decision. But my wife is a, a very excellent baker. We have large fruit and vegetable gardens and stuff. So she makes pies. And so one year half joking for my birthday, I said, will you feed me a pie with your feet? And so that's what she did. So I was just completely stripped down. Again, I kind of like the uh, clothed female nude male or yeah. completely naked, pen, both of us pending mood. We have a couch in our room and we have the bed in the room. And she just sat on the edge of the bed and put a piece of pie. I didn't want to ruin the whole pie. We didn't know how this would go. And just put a piece of pie on the ground and just kind of, you know, tapped in it. And at first, very just like present a piece for me to eat off of her foot or whatever else. And then it kind of turned funny where she'd, you know, stuff it in there with her foot or, you know, kind of smeared across my face, which is that little bit of playfulness. Yeah. I see it as kind of a degrading thing, but that's not her intention. It's just the playfulness. Oh my God. Okay. We talked about chastity a little bit at the beginning, but what about specifics of like, do you wear anything? Do you have a accoutrement that goes with it? Like, is there anything more to say about it that feels like relevant? And then I do want to hear about like pregnancy and lactation play. At one point in our early internet days, we also ended up doing testing of toys for a couple of toy companies. There weren't that many couples. They could get reviews <sighs> from single women, single men, but having reviews from a couple was different. Yeah. And across those, when you go on the web to any different sales site, there's here's toys for women, here's masturbators for men, here's strap-ons for whoever wants strap-ons. And then when you look specifically at couples toys, it's very limited. And couples toys normally points to things like a Wii vibe where it's a, a vaginal insertable that has a, a second wand that comes out for clitoral stimulation. And then there's cock rings. Yeah. And that's pretty much it normally. Maybe maybe they'll have some velvet handcuffs or something. So early on, we had experience with cock rings and we, we did scenes like, oh, nurse, the cock ring stuck on me. How do I get rid of my erection? <laughs> and in searching for cock rings, also got into ball weights, which look similar to a, a cock ring, but are often longer, like half inch, inch line. Yeah. And they're normally magnetic. So whereas a cock ring, you kind of have to squeeze everything in there. Yeah. These, you literally pull your testicle down some and then it magnets on and you, you make sure that you don't have a pinch of skin where that magnet hits because they're rare earth magnets yeah. and they will hurt. <laughs> and I discovered that. And, and a lot of the community will use that to purposefully elongate their testicles for aesthetic purposes or whatever else. But to me, it was twofold. It was one, it was really rapid bondage. It's something that is there. It's a very heavy weight. You feel it. You know it. And the other one where it plays interestingly is like doggy style sex. My wife had commented on that she really enjoys the smacking of testicles against her vagina during doggy style sex. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, if I can amplify that without me having to run a marathon to really slam in there and risk early ejaculation because of that, great. So- these are like me going, hey, things that go on the penis and testicles and whatever else, these are cool things that are a little bit different from our vibrators, our strap-ons, whatever else. So with trying to figure out my mindset and while we're both switchy, I'm further to each end of the spectrum than she is. So maybe I'm a negative 10 to a plus 10 and she goes from a negative five to a plus five. So I can really swing variantly. And so I was trying to figure out ways where I can have the mindset that I want to of being controlled or anything else without requiring excessive out of comfort zone from her on that and enter the online community and seeing chastity cages. And we had dealt with female chastity devices for some of her early shoots, bondage people and stuff. One of them was a very good steel worker and he made very elaborate female chastity cages, but they were play pieces. And that's how chastity started for us at first is it started as just play. There are many people who choose to do it very long term, or they set limits for themselves and reward periods, whether they're in a relationship or not. For us at first, it was playtime thing. It was like, Hey, everybody's in bed. We're going to shower. We're going to feel good. I'm freshly cleaned. And she would go, hey, I'm going to go start the dishes or something that doesn't sound sexy. I'm going to disappear for a little bit. Yeah. See if you can get yourself cooled down because you have to be soft to be able to get the damn thing on. There's part of that too of like knowing that it's coming, knowing that it's going on. That alone is a fight because it's like, oh, hey, stop being excited so that we can be excited. 
And so it would go on and we would get into whatever sexual participation we were going to get into that night. And the confinement of it, uh, most of the devices are some type of either nylon or steel cage that goes over the penis. And then you have essentially a cock ring behind the testicles that that attaches to. So if you attempt to become erect in it, there is a restriction around the girth of your penis. There's a restriction around the length of your penis. And if your penis starts to win against the nylon or steel, whatever your device is made out of, then that back cock ring that's behind your testicles will start to push forward, which also will now add a restriction or a pressure to your testicles. It is a discomfort that with a properly fitting device is a very good discomfort to me. It is a, I want this and I'm having it taken from me. To us though, it was very session-based. It was, hey, we take a shower, we manage, I'd manage to get this on, she'd come back, we'd make out, we'd have oral sex. Sometimes it would just be, hey, I'm gonna give you a hot stone massage and whatever else, which that alone to me has me struggling within my confines. And then some nights she would go, okay, thank you. And that's the end of the night. So early on at the, okay, thank you. Neither of us were comfortable with me sleeping in it because people who are new to it will still have nocturnal erections and stuff like that. And you wake up. Likewise, you can urinate while wearing the device, but normally you're going to want to be seated. And sometimes if you like wake up at 4am and you have to get it, it's just, you don't want to mess with that at first. (laughs) And so at first it would still be like, okay, well, thank you for the experience and unlock me. And we put the device away and still go to bed. Or there's been many a time where it's worked well for both of us because me not knowing if it's going to turn into an orgasmic or whatever else situation for me allows me to focus better. I feel like it's a little bit like putting blinders on a horse. It doesn't stop the performance of that horse, but it lets them become more focused on the task at hand. And so if I'm not focused on my own pleasure or conversely, if I'm not focused on restricting my own pleasure to not ejaculate too early and feel like I ruined something and whatever else, then I'm free of all those thoughts. It also allowed her to go, oh gosh, this thing that I already know he thinks of it as a reward, but now he really thinks of it as a reward. My first device, I think was a, an eBay. I feel like this is common in the community. It was like an eBay $12. I made sure that it you know, didn't have sharp edges on it. It wasn't going to hurt me, whatever worked, didn't fit poorly or anything else. But we eventually, after a year or more of that, went to a slightly more expensive device that is made in the USA and is 3D printed and well sanded. And instead of having like two sizes, you have 10 sizes of the ring and who knows how many sizes of the actual penis part. So you can get a very appropriate fit. And that allows much longer term wear. You don't end up with chafing. It's safe to wear through metal detectors and travel gates. It is safe to swim in and go to the beach in. And because of that, it allows you to do more. Have you done any of these things? Yes. We just a month or so ago went on a cruise. Don't get the impression that it's as strict as flying, but uh, then it is a metal lock, but it's such a small amount and it's right behind your zipper and your button on your jeans. So even if they do call you out, they normally just wand it. And there's been people who just say, oh, I have jewelry. And (laughs) the very worst case scenario is you show the agent your jewelry because normally if you tell them you've got jewelry, they presume you have a Prince Albert piercing or something like that and just say, yeah, go ahead. You're perfect. But being on that cruise, it allowed word in the ocean, word in pools, wear it on your clothing, whatever else during that. And that took something and just added a little extra elevation of mentally whatever, because then even when we're doing some other action, it's still present as like a, a reminder. Um, I feel like it's kind of like wedding bands to people or uh, callers with some misses where they go, Hey, I can feel my collars there. I can feel when it isn't there. Uh, Cause you also get ghosting with it where if you've worn it for a period of time and then you take it off, then hours later, the day later or whatever else, you might be like, oh, oh, wait, no, it's not there. But it feels like it is because yeah. our new endeavor with it is um, ejaculating without removing the cage. So that's gone back to using Hitachi magic wands and stuff to stimulate the penis and the testicles still while the cage is on, as well as I've many times in my life been able to ex- experience hands-free ejaculation through pegging 
and getting it through pegging while not being able to get a full erection due to the cage we're endeavoring to. It's not there yet. Oh, that's so cool. You guys have done so much cool stuff. I really am curious to hear about the pregnancy and lactation stuff. So we are both planners. I I said that first date on the beach, we went, do you want kids? Do you want this and that? (laughs) And throughout our time, uh, uh, over 17 years, between different jobs we've had, whether we were working long hours, different diets we've had, different financial situations and whatever else, both of us have had varying body images. In our relationship, I've been everything from 160 pounds when I was, you know, fresh out of high school and stuff to over 235 pounds when I first started pole dancing. So through that, we both spent a lot of time affirming that our love and or desire for our partner is not based on the flesh suit we're wearing, but also constantly reminding them that we do really, really, really like it anyways. Yeah. And when she got pregnant, I had this fantastic idea that I'm going to become this model husband and and model parent and make sure that I take advantage of all, oh, well, she's going to need lotioning and she's going to need foot rubs because she's going to have, you know, potentially swelling in her feet or anything else. Oh, her back, it's going to suck because... This kid's going to put weight on the front of her and it's going to tilt her hips and her back is going to need a lot of attention through hot stone massage and anything else that we can think of. And so it allowed me to play out a lot of that. But so there's like this whole other woman that emerged from her because even before our first child was born, the maternal instincts and tendencies and whatever else came out in her. So things like reading books to our unborn child and things like that. So there was a lot of nurturing that was to her body, but it was to her body for the sake of our child. And there's also intention and studies regarding exposure of unborn children to loud sounds, like living in industrialized areas and stuff, as opposed to exposing the same child to very light and gentle classical music at night, things like that. And I'll say that there's research, but I can't quote it, regarding the mindset of the mother throughout pregnancy and the wellness that that will assist the child with. If a mother's body is constantly pushing harmful or negative thoughts, and that's not to blame anybody who has those, um, it's not to say they're doing something wrong, but that is less preferred than someone who is experiencing happiness continuously or having their brain dump a lot of serotonin into their body. So pleasuring them, whether it's purely sexual pleasure or just happiness, feeling loved, whatever else, has another level of importance at that point. You are not just trying to make one person feel good. You are trying to make one person feel good and nurture another and set the one that you're nurturing up for a positive upbringing. Mm. So that's the nice thoughts of it. The other part of it is just, there's this other woman now. There is body changes, there is hip changes, there are changes to the abdomen, there are changes to the breast. If there is a part of someone when they are pregnant, it changes. The closest thing I can compare it to, to someone who hasn't had a a spouse or hasn't gone through pregnancy, is um, if you take the eroticism of your partner or somebody else, like completely dyeing their hair and dressing in a way that they never have before, If you take that and like multiply it by a thousand, like it's the, you know, that the core person that you love and care for is here, but it's a whole new book cover on it. That's like a very light dabbling into it, but you just take that and like really, really ramp it up. And that's where it is. Wow. Lactation began uh, shortly before giving birth, but it's a different consistency at that point in time for, for an early infant. So we were both very hesitant about doing anything with it because we're like, Oh gosh, you have to make sure there's enough for it. You don't want to steal that baby's food. Exactly. But she was fantastic with it. Our child was fantastic with it as well. Um, No problems with latching or anything else. But she also would find herself producing excessively. A lot of people have this and they end up selling it to different uh, milk banks and leagues that work with women who are not producing sufficiently. But she wasn't eligible to do that because of her gestational diabetes. They considered her to have a pre-existing health condition. So, hey, we don't want your excess. At the same time, because of that, she would have situations where our child would choose to breastfeed from just one breast. 
So we have a very humorous picture that my wife took a selfie that she had where she has an A cup breast on one side of her and like a D on the other because the one had engorged and our child was refusing to drink from it. So the correct thing to do is not let it get to that extreme when it's slightly smaller, either you force the child over or you pump it. So she was just pumping it. And at times when she would be in a hot shower or something, she would just plain leak. Well, shower time is really easy time to get, hey, a little bit of privacy and sexual time. So very often, um, almost always, we're showering together. And well, hey, if I'm already in the shower with you and you're squeezing milk out of your breast and it's shooting all over, hey, what's that like? And that was the, oh, tasting it and whatever else and then finding it's fun. Unfortunately, to everybody who's ever thought of it, it does not work well as a lubricant. It is yeah, uh, no. <laughs> the, to the disappointment of men and, and women <laughs> everywhere. We also uh, did that for fetish content because we were still doing fetish content. And fetish content with a pregnant woman has a market. And then when you're no longer pregnant, there is still absolutely a market for breast milk, whether it's just pumping, whether it's spraying it all over the shower wall and drawing your finger through it whether it's uh, using it in conjunction with coconut oil or something to do hand jobs, whether it's just suckling at the breast and tasting it or whatever else, there's a market for it. And it's fun. So if we're already going to do this, it's already fun for us. It doesn't take that long to post-produce a very amateur level clip and make side money off of it. So that was with our first child. And then she breastfed rather continuously. And then when we had years later, our second child, First child is often overprotected. You go, oh my gosh, they tripped and fell. You're okay. You're okay. By the second child, you go, oh yeah, they don't have like their kneecaps aren't solid yet. It's okay that you fell. Like if you're not screaming, you're not hurt. Like it's okay, honey, you're fine. And the same is true of the pregnant body the second time. The first time we weren't so ridiculous as to go, oh no, am I hurting the baby by putting my penis in you? We weren't like that, but there was positional concerns like, oh, hey, is being doggy style, is that, you know, you're swaying around it and whatever else, is that going to be problematic? We had a lot less of those concerns for the second child, which allowed us to be a lot more adventurous with things, still not doing anything bondage, BDSM, whatever with it. But even just with casual sex and whatever else, being more adventurous than we would have been out of initial caution. Uh, Likewise, I am big on lists and experiences and categorizing things. We don't participate in anal sex often. We do pegging and stuff, but we don't do anal sex to her very often. It's just not of of interest to her. But I I, I went, hey, so you're nine months pregnant and they're due in two weeks. Never have I ever had anal sex with a pregnant woman. And that was one of those like explicit yes things days before giving birth. We're having sex and interacting throughout it, whatever else. And she pauses and kind of pushes my shoulders up and going, "Uh uh-oh, you know, did I angle wrong or something like that? And she goes, never have you ever had anal sex with a pregnant woman? And I went, (gasps) and and I couldn't zip around and find, you know, lubrication quick enough. And uh, that was a a fantastic experience as well, because there's, well, because it's a fantastic experience, but I would like to think in my head that there's also anatomical hip changes and whatever else that also makes it different. And then, yeah, lactation stuck around through that with our three children, each of them nursed until they were about two years old. But when we say until they're two years old, that's not eight times a day as you do an infant. That's like, Hey, after you're one, you get like this at nighttime just to help you go to sleep for the whole night, whatever else, which means the rest of the time it's all for me. Wow. This is incredible. Okay. Obviously we need to start wrapping up, but would you just like list off other stuff you've done and loved? (laughs) Fucking machines were a great adventure in the fetish stuff. Fucking machines, um, forced orgasms, particularly forced orgasm with bondage were a lot of fun. Um, while I worked at the university, I worked with the security systems there. So I knew the blind spots. So we had a particular parking garage rooftop that we liked to go to film at the top of. Amazing. And the first time we filmed up there, I had blindfolded her and drove her around and she didn't know if we were still on campus or not. And then just took her out of my truck, parked the truck so it was blocking the one camera angle view and had her bent to the side of the parking garage and fucked her there. And that had a really fun, I don't know where I am. I don't know if there's an audience. I don't know anything else. We've dealt with all sorts of really weird toys through toy testing. A favorite that stands out to us 
is there was a talking dildo. It was intended for husbands to like record erotic audio for their wife while they went out of town. <laughs> but it came with a sample disc. And the sample disc was a very heavy French accent demanding what this woman does. And um, we gave it away. We gave it away at one of the conventions we went to. And we had roommates at that convention. We let some, some buddies stay with us. And we woke up in the middle of the night because we just hear groaning from the bed next to us. So there was us and one queen, our friend and another queen, and then another model sleeping on the pullout couch. And we hear this like moaning coming from her friend's bed. And he was a single man, very respectful. And we're like, he's not over there doing anything. What, what is the moaning? And we flip on the lights and the model is perked up in her bed because she thinks my wife and I are having sex. And she's just like waiting to see something. And we look. And here's the guy in the middle and out of our grab bag of toys we were giving away. He had taken the talking dildo because he thought it was hilarious. So he had it there and was just holding it up like a lightsaber as he oh goes, take off your top. <laughs> <laughs> large insertions and stuff like that. Strangely, we did a lot more large insertions to not quite almost fisting levels of stuff. Pre-children, post-children, there's a little bit more hesitancy about it mentally for both of us, but it's also just time that's not a everybody's eating dinner let's get in there and do it yeah you don't want to rush that one okay before i ask you the wrap-up questions i would really love to hear you speak briefly to your extreme switchy side i suspect i might have that in common but i'm just getting to know the other half of it <laughs> so I have trouble negotiating it because I early on tried to negotiate it within other people's boundaries. So, yeah. you, you know, little quizzes that are like, do you like this? And I'm like, yeah, I really like tying people up. Do you like being tied up? Yeah, I really like being tied up. And it seems a lot of those things just people think cancel themselves out. I struggle again with dominant versus top because I intermingle them versus submissive side and bottom side. For me, I really like topping a lot of things that I find aren't sex. Mm -hmm. So I like topping rope play. I like topping impact play. I say that I like sexually topping. There are times where I am very in control. I am very subjectively violent. I am controlling, demanding, demeaning, whatever else. But when I think topping stuff, I think of non-bedroom things. And I say that as I'm sitting in our dungeon. When I think submissively, that is my escape. It's my Alice's Wonderland. It is the world is crazy and I want to go somewhere else. And that's not a, I want to go somewhere else. Like I want to be somewhere else. It's more, again, perhaps the horse blinders. Yeah. So that becomes very service oriented, especially cleaning things, caring for things. I do leather work. I'll find myself going and finding her leather boots and cleaning and conditioning them just because it's a, hey, this is me caring for you, but I realize you're busy and this is what I want to do, as well as receiving impact play, receiving things like that. Having joking and teasing about maybe value as a person or whatever else, because from my wife, I can hear like, you are worthless. You are just a dick here to be ridden when I want to. I can hear that type of stuff and I can believe it, but I can believe it within the safety of knowing where it's being delivered from, as opposed to coming from a work thing or somebody else where I feel like I fucked up whatever else. And I will sit and dwell on that and go, how could I have, what should I have said differently in that yeah. meeting or that interview or that anything? And I will get stuck in feedback loops of analyzing my own behavior. And having those other things allows me to turn down that other noise or perhaps turn up a white noise around it. So day to day, like people who go, oh, I know that guy. He's definitely a bottom, a top, a switch or whatever. I enjoy people seeing the ambiguity in me. That's part of, again, using my spouse's openly gendered name at work. I enjoy that. Sure. Keep people guessing. Yeah. And I don't know what sets off either factor of it. Things like chastity play. We have a little hook by the light switch in our room because we both touch the light switch often. So if the key is hanging there, then that is an open signal for this is the mood I'm in. Because if I'm in a very like toppy mood and I just want to take her and throw her around and fuck her six ways to Sunday and 
say vile things to her about what a worthless piece of cunt meat she is just for me to fucking come in. Um, then I don't want that to be the day that after dinner she comes and says, Hey, put this on because I might fuck you later or I might make you wait because my mood isn't there. Yeah. So it makes the mood available and kind of publishes it without me having to go, Hey, I'm really feeling like this or that. I love that. What are your hopes for your sex life going forward? It's a shallow first hope. My first hope is to reaccelerate it now that our children aren't very, very young because the younger they are, the more direct attention you have to keep. So as the first child aged up, we, you know, were able to do more and whatever else. And then just to kind of stay the path. I feel like we have a very good path and I look at it and I go, wow, look at where we were back in 2005. Look at where we were in 2010. Look at this and this and the different chapters of our lives. And then I go, we're writing a pretty damn good book. Like if we just keep on keeping on, it's going to end up in a good place. There's no, oh, great. I hope by chapter 20, we live in another country and do this. There's a, you know, just follow the path. Wow. If you could go back in time and give younger you a piece of sex advice, what age or ages would you pick and what would you say? I'd like to think that I'd go to my middle teens, so 14, 15, and say to own my desires, not necessarily to express them to whomever I'm dating, but to at least own them to myself, not to try to repress something because of thinking it could never happen or anything else like that. Alec Bond, thank you so much for being a guest on Sex Stories. Do you have a sex question you'd like to ask me? If you could control a human form, say we magically can modify our bodies in any way possible, revertibly, you know, hey, yeah. surgery free, you just pop this off, <laughs> pop that on. Mr. Potato Head style, what would you create first? And I mean, if you could just pop off an arm and now it's a penis or you no longer have an anus and a penis. You just have two vaginas because hell, why not two vaginas? I, I'm curious just where that would go for you. Lovers, that's our show. If you want to give your answers to any of the questions that you heard in this episode or share your thoughts, click the comment link in the description. If you, like me, love sex stories, especially if you really look forward to listening to the new episodes every week, I would be tickled pink. I'd also be probably red and wet. If those of you who have the means would help cover production costs, visit creation.place slash support for a nice, neat, beautiful list of links to our sponsors, bonus content, and direct ways to make my dreams come true. Again, that's creation.place slash support. A no-cost way to help sex stories grow is to share sex stories with a friend, post about it if you are the social internet type, and take six to nine seconds to rate and review on Apple and Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. I would love to receive 69 new kind, coherent reviews to start the new year strong. If you would like to apply to be a guest, and I hope you want to, fill out the application at www.creation.place slash sex stories. The whole form is also on the contact page. Creation Place is also where you can find the full list of sex stories questions that I offer to prep guests before our interview, in case any of you out there want some inspiration when it comes to getting curious about yourself or your partner. Sex Stories is produced from start to finish by me, Wyo, and is edited by the human angel on Earth that is Kimberly Loftus. As always, thank you for keeping me in your ear. May your holidays be merry and snuggly and bright. May you spread love in ways that bring you great pleasure. And whether they are naughty or nice, may you happily and joyfully remember to create and then share some sex stories. 